Hello, hello, and welcome back. So glad you guys can join me once again. I am Wicked Raider 22. We are traveling through, moseying through, moving through this beginning journey of Raid Shadow Legends. All right, guys, we are going to take a look, and I think I'm going to take the leap. We've come to a point where I need to decide if unlocking the gem mine is going to be worth it. I am up to 560 gems. I know, I know. I spent a couple of gems, I have to admit, but I was able to pull in some champions. I couldn't resist. And so I did it. And we're going to look at those champions that I pulled by, according to running some, um, finishing up some quests and acquiring some shards. I pulled those shards because I could not wait. And honestly, I'm kind of glad that I did. So first things first, let's take a look at the gem mine. Something to keep in mind, if you go back to earlier videos, you'll notice that this, just like our forge and our portal, great hall, these are all areas that you unlock as you continue to move forward. So when you first begin the game, all of these areas will be locked away. And as you move through with your starting champion and begin to build teams and acquire more champions, you will unlock this area. Now, even on my personal account, I have not unlocked the gem mine, but I remember a veteran kind of really pushing the thought of spending your gems wisely. So let's look at what the gem mine would offer us. The gem mine produces gems for you, for your bastion. Collect your gems by tapping on the icon above the building in your bastion. So level one of three, you can't level it up. It will produce one gem every four hours and 48 minutes. So I'm thinking, you know, 24 hours in a day, roughly you are looking at about five gems, almost four or five gems um, per day. So we're looking at about five gems per day. If I'm looking in the course of a week, that is giving me five times seven. So I'm up to 35 course of a month. So you're running it passively. It's something that I could pour into and you know, just kind of sitting and doing, you know, the early math on that one, you know, you, you start to think, well, when, or how long would it take for me to kind of reap the benefits? When would I really start to notice, you know, what was going on? And I realized as you go week by week, even after you make it through um, that first month, for example, you know, you have 125 gems per month, just passively. That can become pretty important, especially if you're the type who you collect those gems and kind of move forward. Now, one thing I would like to know is what happens as you move up each level. That's something that I'm not sure. Unlock the gem mine to start producing gems. And the time until it's full is one day and two minutes. So I think it's going to be worth it. It's a lot of gems. And that's probably why I have paused because I know from previous experience, once we <laughs> spend these gems, it's going to take us a while to get them back. Now, keep in mind, a lot of the gems we've earned so far have come from different events, tournaments. They're really, really generous, like all games are at the very beginning. And so if you ever go back and start a new account, You'll notice that the number of energy points, the amount of gems that you acquire over time are all going to be important. You also will notice that as you start to progress through the game, you do not have that easy access any longer. So we're going to do it. We are going to click. We're going to go in. And we have now opened our gem line. We can upgrade it, of course, for 500. We can upgrade to that level three for 500 more. So that means you've invested a total of 1,500 gems. I think over time, we will definitely reap the benefit of it. But for now, we're going to see exactly how this goes. You'll notice as you go from level one to level two, you end up getting gems twice as quickly. So instead of taking four hours and 48 minutes, it's going to take two hours and 23 minutes which kind of leads me to believe that if we do it one more time, we're probably going to go down to one gym every, what, one hour and 10 minutes or so? 
So something to think about. We'll see how this goes. We'll see how this pans out, how we feel. And we'll kind of figure out, was it worth it or not? If you have had the opportunity to open your mind, did you do it? Did you take the leap? I would love to know in the comments to kind of see where you guys are, because that was a big purchase. We are now back down to the 60 gym level. So we're going to be really, really careful on what we're working on. Now, let's take a look at what we pulled from the previous shards. I completed a task and ended up earning three um, ancient shards. Open those and take a look. We added Aethel to our list. So she is a rare champion. For some of you guys, you picked her as your lead champion at the beginning of the game instead of Kale, Gaelic, and of course, Elhane. We had Gaelic. I thought about keeping him. I know some people have really six-starred him, really ascended him pretty far, but I was at a point of picking between him and other champions, and unfortunately, he ended up being consumed. So he was one of those that was actually consumed as food. Um, I am ashamed to say it, but I have not yet regretted using him in that capacity. It was one of those, I was just making, you know, choices. Now, to be honest, if you ask me who I replaced him with, I have no idea, but it's probably someone who fell in the category of shield guard. I kind of feel the same way about their skill set um, as far as my teams are organized now. And remember, every account is going to be a little bit different because we're all pulling different champions. Now, I do want to take a look at her skill set. She does fall under the banner of Sacred Order. Um, she is most definitely attack-based. So I went in and tried to pull artifacts that were as close to what she would need as possible. Um, currently, I do not have a lot of great artifacts. And I know that the artifacts you acquire within dungeons, within crypts, um, just completing missions as your clan moves up and as you advance, it becomes a lot better as well. So it's something I definitely look forward to are those five and six star, you know, kind of percentage based artifacts. Skill wise, though, with Aethel, we're taking a look at her first skill, which is Strike Down. Here's something I noticed really quickly. Wow, y'all, the, the number of books. That is pretty deep, but we're going to go with it. On her first attack, she will attack one enemy three times. She has a 75% chance of placing a 25% weakened debuff for two turns on the last hit. And of course, all of her attacks are attack base. So the damage that she's able to do is attack base, which in theory runs pretty well. But I know that the artifacts I want are going to be further along in the game. Now, A2. Divine Blades level one attacks all enemies. Damage is based on attack. This particular skill can be ascended. So of course, they're going to add in a little extra. She would have an extra 15% chance of inflicting a critical hit. This would be great if it was 30, um, perhaps, because 15% eh, doesn't take as many books to buff that up. So you can go from 15, add in 20, 25, 30, 40, so we can get it up to a 40%, but if this started at 30 and then we add it on, that would be pretty impressive. Last but not least, you have higher blessings, so places a 25% increased attack buff on this champion for two turns, places a 30% increased defense buff on this champion for two turns. Um, if this champion's current HP is less than 50%, she also gains an extra turn. Now, I have seen this particular um, skill really come in handy. It is on a four turn cooldown. You can get that down to a three turn, but this one can be pretty, pretty helpful. And her aura, of course, she's going to increase ally HP and all battles by 15%. So I think, honestly, if I run one team, where she is bringing some of that damage. I would run Shield Guard on a separate team. I'm really thinking of, you know, how can I best have those three major teams? And some of these champions I'm going to move and only use in the arena. Some of these are only going to be used to lead um, the food through campaign. A few of them are kind of thinking as dungeon teams. The more I get in, the more champions I kind of run into. 
you're asking yourself those questions. What's going to be most important? All right. Now, so she was pulled. Um, I'll pull a couple of others. Here's another one. Lameller, I guess is how we're going to pronounce that. Pulled him. Guys, I have no idea. Same banner of Sacred Order. I have not put any artifacts on this, excuse me, particular champion. Um, I wasn't impressed. He is HP based, of course, that good old rare. And Sacred Flame, which sounds familiar, attacks one enemy, has a 10% chance of placing a 30% debuff for two turns. And remember, he's HP based, doesn't require a lot of books. Crystal Burst will be the second attack, and this is on that three-turn cooldown. Attacks all enemies, um, and once you ascend them three stars, you're going to add in, places a 25% decrease attack debuff for two turns. I'm kind of interested here. I don't know. Something about that that I think may actually be helpful. And the other thing I like, instead of 25%, if you take here, you can book him up additional 15%. So you can make this a 40% decreased attack debuff for two turns. Now you can take this from a three turn cooldown to a two. So when I got to Crystal Burst, I kind of paused because either there's another champion that uses his skills in tandem with theirs. There's something about this champion that's pretty familiar. And it may be because I usually have videos running in the background that are you know, describing how effective champions are or the different areas where they can be used in the game. But we'll check out the reviews on him in just a second as well. He does have a passive for Die Hard, so he decreases the damage taken by the champion by 30% when his HP drops below 30%. All right, so pretty helpful. Definitely understand where it's coming from. I like the fact that when the HP does drop to a certain percentage, um, this will kick in. The only problem is depending on where you are in the game, you can still get a one hit smack or one hit wonder placed on you and it will be all over either way. The aura is going to increase ally HP and faction crypts by 22%. And there are a couple of crypts I can think of where... 22% may actually be pretty decent. I put him in the class, honestly, with, um, of course, Aethel, but I'm thinking even a Templar is what he kind of reminds me of, which he's Sacred Order. Um, the Sanctum Protector is another one. They are not going to come out being the strongest. I think his skill set is kind of similar to some of the energy Templar has given me. I've heard much stronger reviews here. As you can see, Templar has 885. Um, Lamella has 68. Pretty much he's ranking average. So campaign locations, which eh, I'm not really looking for um, a big campaign runner. That area is kind of filled for me. Minotaur, Labyrinth is another area. Definitely not built for Fire Knight. Hydra is also a possibility for him. And if you want to compare... Let's just take those top three areas, you know, arena 3.6 to 3.2. Go to Templar, you know, you look at the same areas and he's much higher rated, 4.6, 4.6, 4.6, 4.4. So, um, you know, 4.5, even in arena. When I'm looking at ability, if I come here, even Sanctum Protector is actually ranked pretty well except for Magic Keep and Fire Knights. Everything else, he's in the four. Well, Lamella is pretty average across the board. So I don't think I'm going to actually take artifacts and place on him. One thing I started doing is if I know I'm going to keep you, you'll notice that I went back to locking those particular champions. Um, the good thing about locking them, it reminds me um, that I intend on keeping that champion and I'll second guess, you know, getting rid of that champion. He's another one. I hold on to them for a second, especially if I'm thinking about um, Faction Crypts, for example, if you're looking for a team to build with that. Those are all areas where you may want to pause before you get rid of a champion, just in case you need them. Now, last but not least, we pull Kutch, is it Kutchler? Um, For this particular dwarf, I'll be honest, I have actually, guys, gone through and I think I've used a couple of dwarves as food that I probably should not have. 
it's one of those factions that I guess I kind of struggle with because many of them, their skill set is extremely one-sided. The hit isn't as strong as, you know, a shield guard, which is kind of disappointing at times. Their speed is at 98, so they're not the slowest at base level by far. Um, but I'm not impressed so far with the ones I've pulled with the amount of power they're displaying. And he is, of course, attack base, which artifact wise is probably one of my weakest areas that I really, really want to work on. So the harder they fall, which this is sounding familiar as well, he's going to attack one enemy two times. This is really common within this faction in particular. You will need to ascend these champions. So if you are holding on to any dwarves, any sacred orders, um, banner lords, any of those, a lot of those champions will require books to definitely get their skill level to where you would like for it to be. Once this champion is ascended, he's going to attack one enemy two times, has an additional 30% chance of inflicting a critical hit if the target is under a decreased debuff. So decreased defense debuff. This is pretty specific. Um, as you can see, you can go in and book and add an additional 25%. So sorry, we actually add an additional 35%. Um, which will bring this to a 65% chance of inflicting a critical hit. This is where dwarves normally take the next level. It's their ability to, you know, every two turns or so, they're hitting with a critical hit. And if you have actually leveled them up to a point, this is where many of them will shine. But it takes the patience of being able to ascend that champion so something to think about based on where your team is at the other thing is this is also on his first attack that i think for me at this point in my game can be a game changer but he's a champion i would probably want to you know increase his ability as just as with with him as food in mind and if I notice during the battles before he's killed off, of course, that there's some potential there, then I would definitely go in and make those changes. Now, soften them up places a counterattack and a 25% increased attack buff on this champion for two turns. Grants an extra turn. If this counterattack was placed on all allies, oh, wow. Now, whoo, gosh, wow. A six turn cooldown that can be decreased to a three turn cooldown. Wow. Um, I, I, wow. I'm, I can't say I'm shocked. I haven't, I know that there are some six turn cooldown skills within the game. I've seen them, you know, within videos, but for some reason, I kind of always associate those with like legendaries or much, much more skilled um, champions. So Cudgeler does not necessarily hit me as the type of champion that would need um, that slow of a hit. But I can kind of see why once you ascend him, this percentage increases so much because probably 70% of the time he's using the harder they fall. So that could be interesting because when he does rotate out of this, this skill could pay off. It's probably the passive that will either seal the deal for you or not. And I'm still hanging because this requires a lot of books. And I'm paying attention to that one. Um, here, whatever buff debuff we're going to get, that chance can be changed by 30%. Um, so yeah, by 30%. So has a 20% chance of placing a 30% decreased defense debuff. For two turns when attacking targets with a higher defense than this champion, which shouldn't be hard. Has a 20% chance of decreasing the damage taken by 20% when attacked by enemies with higher attack than this champion. So it's all dependent. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't ex excited. It was, it was, I wasn't ecstatic for him. Um, I think he is kind of like, you know, Lameller potential, but I'm not sure. Um, I think it's also kind of like Sanctum Protector with, eh, I'm not really impressed with, but I definitely need these champions in order to be able to move 
and ascend my higher level of champions. Um, right now, honestly, I like the miscreated monster, but I would love to get a 100% HP support type of champion. I would really love a strong support because I do feel as though that's what my team is most definitely lacking. Um, the Rotting Mage was a good holdover, but I was noticing as we progressed, even in hard and started moving through different battles in campaign, um, that Rotting Mage was ended up being the first champion that was being killed off over and over again. And it wasn't really mattering how long I was leaving him um, in or what I was buffing around him or adding to his kit set. It was really becoming difficult to keep him alive, depending on where we were. Now, I will say sometimes you have these pop up and you've gotten rid of a champion that you really want back, which honestly, y'all, on my paid account, I would probably get Sniper again. I'm so serious. I mean, I just love me some Sniper. I do not have no hate on my personal account either. So it's kind of one of those. All right. So we're good here. Nothing is expiring. What about Shards? Should we open it? I've been thinking about it. We did the mine. I'm thinking shards will probably be a good one. I know that a lot of people wait for events. I know um, it's always pretty good, but honestly, I've actually been looking up and pulling some pretty good rares from mystery shards as well. I, I pulled a few, but it's all depending on what we need. And somewhere locked away, I just get this feeling that my 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 support champion that I need is gonna just pop out. Now remember these are the shards that we open. Um just looking for something kind of good to pull from. Okay, we're gonna talk about Zephyr Sniper. All right. Um this is one in particular and I'll just go ahead and talk about her now. <sighs> I have pulled Zephyr Sniper before and I have used Zephyr Sniper probably about 20 or 30 times as food in my first account. Guys, I've seen some people, and I mean, look at her stats, y'all. Her, her base is low. Her attack makes me nervous. Her speed is, is okay as a start, but it's rough. She has two skills. Suppressive fire attacks all enemies, and I like that, especially when she's on a team with someone like Elhane, with Sniper, Deliana, like anybody who's throwing out, um, Kale is another one, an all attack. You will get an all attack from Shield Guard as well. Those all attacks, especially when they come from two or three of your champions, can be everything. It cuts down on the amount for campaign. It can cut down on the amount of time used in arena as well. But when we're looking at her, she attacks all enemies and has a 15% chance of increasing the cooldown of a random skill on each target by one turn. This makes me think of bosses. There are certain crypts, there are certain dungeons where I need their skill to cool down. This also makes me think of where we're stuck at in campaign. I've reached, I'm trying to think of the name of the area an area with the dragon at the very end and his passive is just hitting over and over again. So not the strongest champion, but I definitely could use the skill and she is defense based. Now her only other skill places a 7.5% 7, 7 continuous heal buff on all allies for two turns. You can bring this down from a four turn cooldown to a three um, honestly, I would keep her for this first skill because the other thing is I can take this 15% chance. We're going from 15, 20, 25, 30, 40% chance of increasing the cooldown of a random skill. And I would specifically use her in the area of certain, certain dungeons. I can definitely think of where my team is stuck. Even if she only stayed alive for two or three turns to put a reviver on this team with her, and it may be worth our while. So for now, she's going to be that champion that we will definitely hold on to. All of these other guys, I'm pretty sure you've seen before. I have pulled Tano Stewart a few times before. We don't really hold on to him for whatever reason. I kind of dig his design, though. I must say it's pretty cool standing on the book, too. 
But he's one you will pull a few times. Vermin Killer attacks one enemy, has a 25% chance of placing a 2.5% poison debuff for two turns. And we don't have anyone who deals with poison right now. The other thing he does is, oh gosh, the books. I, I was trying to ignore here, you know, wow, that's that's a lot. But this just reminded you quite a bit, but attacks one enemy and has a 50% chance of increasing the duration of two random debuffs on the target by one turn. I would probably be all over him just because of his first attack. You are adding damage wise 20%. Um, and you can also add 10% to that buff debuff. So, you know, it's not the best, but with the beginning game where we are, it can definitely prove helpful. So at least these two, we've had pit fighter before, um, nothing amazing about his critical hit, nothing amazing. He does decrease the target's turn meter by 50%. You can decrease this with a couple of books, but there are other champions that can also do this. I've been interested, honestly, in taking this particular champion and just playing with him for a little while just to see what he does because there's only like one area where I think I would need this particular skill. And then after that, I probably would have another champion by that point um, that would allow me to do it a lot more efficiently. So our two stars will keep and everyone else will be automatic food. Let's see, there's something else that I learned that I'm gonna show you guys as well. And I won't have a good example. So all these guys here will qualify as food. Let's do 10 more, this will be 30. Then we'll just start making a couple of choices. You pull cultists a lot. Um, people don't talk about them. Infiltrator is another one you're gonna pull pretty often. Um, nothing too big, nothing too big with them. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh guys. Oh my gosh. I just watched a video about this guy and oh, wow. Just watched a video by Ash. Um, if you have not visit his page, man, just type it in. But Ash Ray Shadows, oh, this one, this is one of his favorites. This guy falls really, really high in prestige with quite a few champions. And I had previously pulled him on my first account and I used him for food so quickly. I don't even think I read his skill set, to be honest. And it's so funny because less than 10 minutes ago, went into a full video about this particular champion in particular. And I am sitting here with the slightest of a grin, just, all right, we are, mm, let's take a look. Let's take a look at the skill set because I promise you, I couldn't remember it right off. And it's really, really simple. Whoa, repose, I guess that's how we say that one. Attacks one enemy, decreases the turn meter by 30%. Remember our last champion? I told you guys, this sounded really familiar. He manipulates the turn meter and there are a couple of dragons. Um, I'm thinking about Dragon Slayer in particular. There's another dungeon in particular where this becomes really important because you need him just for that skill. So the turn meter by 30% if the attack is critical. So you want defense and I want an increased crit rate on this particular champion. For his second attack, later rest, attacks one enemy. Enemies killed by this skill cannot be revived. I am so not concerned about this second skill, but I would definitely love to do more with this first skill. You can take it from 30% to 50%. If that's the case, every other time you're throwing it, you have a really good chance of decreasing that turn meter. This can provide your team with that longevity that you are looking for. So remember, he is the second champion that we pulled. Um, we will definitely be keeping him. Everyone else is kind of food. I love how this picture looks with Valspawn. I don't know if we've ever looked at Valspawn. I know I've never built her. I've always used her as food. So, wow, the number of books. Hellblight attacks one enemy, has a 5% chance of placing 
a 25% decrease attack debuff for two turns. That debuff can be buffed up um, to 50%. And the chance can also be increased to 25% chance. So not really that impressive. Heals an ally by 10% of their max HP. And this is another heal that can be increased. So you will be looking at 10, 20, 30, 40, 45% of their max HP. We definitely have other champions that can do it better. So she's probably my third Vile Spawn that I have and will definitely be going into that nice little food collection. What about our Ancient Shard? What do you guys think? Ancient Shards, I would love to pull an Epic or a Legendary. Um, we're not in an event, but I am hoping to pull a healer. Maybe, no, of course not. <laughs> All right, we have Wagon Bane, which actually is a support. Um, this guy, oh, wow. All right, with the chest on the back, with the, I see you. That's, that's a little different. That's a little different. So from the Oberyn tribe, we have a Wagon Bane coming to us, attacks one enemy, and has a 35% chance of placing a 50% decreased accuracy debuff for two turns. That's going to be for Eye Blight. Quite a few books we will be putting into this one. For Hack Gore Magic, attacks one enemy, places a 7.5% continuous heal buff on the ally with the lowest HP for two turns. <sighs> Not the strongest. Um, you can take this from a three turn cooldown to a two. Um, I don't have a lot of support, so let's hope this last one brings us around. Start the mayhem. Attacks one enemy, has a 75% chance of placing a 30% defense debuff for two turns. Also has a 75% chance of decreasing the target's turn meter by 15%. Damage is based, of course, on attack. You can ascend this, which will change to a 60% chance for the debuff. And that's about it. You still will have a 75% chance of decreasing the target's turn meter by 15%. Now, the impact on a turn meter is kind of nice. Um, ascending to three stars is usually not you know, just out of the question, if you decide to invest in this champion, the continuous heal would be nice. <sighs> um, The damage, eh, damage is based on attack, but, but this, this is, yeah. Um, mm, I'm not jumping for joy. I guess we'll say it like that. Um, it's a champion that's a little bit different from our norm, but it's not a champion that probably has me, you know, fully shook and extra excited. And that's kind of how your teams are going to be, you know, forming themselves. Now, I will show you this. Have you ever noticed that certain champions have this little symbol in the middle? And a lot of you guys may not have noticed. What this is telling you is that this particular champion, when they have this little swirl mark, your yin yang, you know, symbol in the middle is telling you that this champion can be used as a fusion so think about it when you go to tavern let's say for example i was trying to upgrade um one of my champions and so i went in and let's see if i have it on anybody else before i start unlocking and i don't think i do normally you pull you will pull um a few regular champions that will have it as well. So let me just go in and unlock him. So let's say with Templar, this message is going to pop up. And a lot of us are so used to seeing it that we don't fully read it because we're used to having those lower level champions that we want to use as food, even though we know that they're a fusion. What I want you guys to do, what I definitely want to encourage you to do, take at least one copy of each um, champion and place it in your vault. I have not done a fusion per se, but I've heard enough champions repeated that I'm going to be confident in saying it to you as well. I've started doing it, so you will be proud. If we go to champions, we go down to this bottom left-hand corner, 
for Champion Vaults. I've been taking, I've just started taking one copy of each champion that I acquire and I place them into the vault. You can add space to your master vault. So that becomes extremely helpful as well. But when it's time for fusions to be done or when you've acquired all the champions you need or there's an event and you want to make it happen, you have what you need as far as champions are concerned. Because of course, that's going to be the one time you never pull what you need. So um, this is another area that you can definitely focus yourself on before you decide to just chomp away and to eat that champion. Well, guys, that's going to do it for this particular video. We had a chance to start our mind. We dived into our shards, of course. We're going to finish up a couple of more runs since we have a good amount of energy to finish out this event and getting ready for clan versus clan. If you have not put your strategy together in a couple of hours, it will definitely be that time to put up as much activity as you can to help support your clan. If you've made it this far in the video, I definitely thank you. I am Wicked Raider 22. Don't forget to subscribe. We upload videos Monday through Friday, posting at 7 a.m. Central Standard Time. You guys keep rating, and I will talk to you soon.